thanks so much for the introduction, and thanks for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, this department and university has a really good reputation. I've been here a few years in Michigan, new to Michigan, so um, I'm really happy just to be interacting with some people I knew and some people I didn't and just getting to know the department. Um, so today I'm going to talk about work from all one system, which I haven't done in a while. So this is sort of a, not necessarily all new data, but a new talk. And it was a good opportunity for me to kind of put together some of these pieces of work from this system to try to see what, if we can find a story or where is this work going. And so I hope you'll bear with me just to kind of, some, some things are more polished than others, but it was sort of fun just to think about the natural history of this system and, and what data I have. This has sort of been pieced together with my startup and small grants. And um, I really like working there, so I'm hoping to find sort of a, a direction for the future. So with that, I just wanted to mention some other themes in my lab because there's a, you know, maybe a quarter or half of my work is in Namibia. Uh, a lot of the rest uh, is focused in Michigan. I can't decide whether to look at this high screen or at my computer. Um, so some of our lab themes are asking, I think that's too much, um, how do water and nitrogen drive microbial function? Um, so that's mostly in soil and terrestrial systems. When does microbial dispersal influence community assembly and evolution? What is the role of microbes in agro and bioenergy systems? So we work in natural to manage systems. Um, previously, a lot of my work was looking at direct effects of disturbance on microbial communities, and now I do a little more with host microbe interaction, mostly the host being a plant. Um, so we have a project looking at how microbes facilitate plants getting nitrogen in degraded lands. Um, so being at KBS, there's a lot of opportunities to work and manage an agricultural system, so I've kind of taken advantage of local field sites. And I should say that, um, yeah, I'm at Michigan State University, but I'm a Kellogg Biological Station is about an hour and 15 minutes from East Lansing, it's closer to Kalamazoo, and there's 12 resident faculty there, so my whole lab and everything is there. So that's just sort of a disclaimer that this, I have a, some other work that I'm happy to talk to people about. Collaborators on the NAMIB work, I just wanted to make some acknowledgements up front. Um, this has been really fun just to get this project going and work with a lot of different groups. Um, this is Kathy and Peter Jacobson from Grinnell College who actually worked with us as an undergrad and then reconnected with later uh, on some work in the NAMIB. Um, we've also started to team up with Kathy Todd Brown who's at Pacific Northwest National Lab. She's an ecosystem uh, carbon modeler. Um, so I really appreciate having her expertise. And then some of the work I'll talk about at the end that's more focused on um, the actual biology of fog. Um, kind of had a serendipitous collaboration where I was working at the NAMIB and someone else was working on the same issue in Maine coastal fog system. And we both had these kind of little and questionable, you know, not sure what to do with data sets. And we kind of came together and were writing a paper that kind of highlights them from both systems. So that's some people from the Cary Institute, um, and that's Robert, my graduate student in Orange there, so he's working on this work. So I'll start with just an um, overall motivation, and that's that, um, the importance of arid land. So arid lands make up a large proportion of land surface. 40% um, of land is arid or semi-arid, and that makes up, or it stores 30% of global carbon. So it plays a really big part in the, the global carbon cycle even though any particular desert or semi-arid land may not have you know, a lot of plants or a lot of microbial respiration. It's also societally important, so it hosts more than a billion people, and these areas are increasing population growth at, at a faster rate than other areas. And then there is a paper that came out a few years ago that showed that arid lands were really responsible for interannual carbon balance. So when we see these you know, kind of the earth breathing systems where we see car earth as a carbon sink versus source. Arid lands seem to be disproportionate, play a disproportionately large role in sort of explaining that variation interannually. So there's something happening just in the, I guess, sensitivity or variability of these lands that kind of make them really important globally. A lot of us know that arid lands will also expand in the future. So the IPCC predicts in a lot of regions that it's gonna get drier. Um, not only more drought, but also more intense rainfall regimes, so 
longer, more dry days um, in a row. And that's kind of confounded with, or, or added with um, additional agricultural stress on, on soils that make them more drought prone. So maybe less soil moisture, even the same amount of rain. So we're kind of taking the Namib Desert and almost using it to test some of these mechanisms that are unknown in arid systems in a way to learn about what's going on in arid lands globally. So the cool thing about working at this field site is you can see it from space, I love that. Um, so this is the Namib over here on the western coast of Africa, um, looking at southern Africa. So I'm just gonna zoom in um, and you can see now the sand, the sand dunes emerging here. So this is what, the whole coast of Namibia um, is, is called the Namib Desert, it's sort of a, a, a coastal desert, but the, the central and southern half form this, um, what's called the Namib Dune Sea. So it's a large area of linear dune system. So these are all sand dunes um, that are blowing, or basically the sand originates from South Africa, and they're kind of blowing and forming these, these dynamic dunes that are moving towards the ocean. And right here, what we see is um, the Kwisib River, and I'll zoom in and show you why that's maybe a misnomer, because it's, there's no water in it. Um, it only flows, it flows anywhere from zero to 100 days a year, but usually you know 20 or less. Um, so it's an ephemeral river, but what happens is this, the sand from the dunes blows up into this riverbed, and it's washed out, the sand is washed out to the ocean. So the river is really what's keeping the dunes um, to the south. And it forms a really um, neat system just because you have these three desert ecosystems coming together um, where you have this dune system and this sort of dry riverbed where there's a lot more vegetation supported and then what's called on the northern part called the gravel plains. So here we see um, Gobabeb Training and Research Center, and that's where a lot of our work is based out of. So here's what it looks like from a different view, and you can see the dunes where we've done a lot of our work, but also um, some out here nearby. So this is a, a field station that was founded in the 60s, and um, it's sort of been the hub of research for a lot of the most charismatic um, organisms in the Namib Desert. So. Here's some of the really neat organisms that are found there. We have the fog basking beetle um, that climbs up into the top of the dunes to catch fog on its back and um, the fog condenses and it drinks it. Um, and you know, there's other, the shovel snouted lizard, there's, there's a multitude of adaptations that make um, to this desert, so to the dry conditions, to the fog um, inputs that I'll talk about in a minute, and to the really hot air temperatures and soil temperatures. So this is a shovel snouted lizard doing this sort of dance where it picks up its two legs at a time and then switches so the sand doesn't get too hot on the sand. Um, it also has this special snout that's perfect for kind of swimming through the sand um, and that's kind of how it gets out of the heat. So um, this is also the golden mole. It has evolved to be completely without eyes. <laughs> um, it's about the size of the palm of your hand. And then, of course, the sidewinder, sidewinding adder, adder. So it's a really fun system to work in. I used to teach people about these organisms. Um, and so they're really engaging, maybe not quite as charismatic or the microbial communities there, um, but there's been pretty scarce work in the Namib in the past on microbial communities, mostly because, because there's so little rain, we sort of assumed that the activity was really negligible. Um, and then in the 90s, some people noticed after some big rains that there are some fungal fruiting bodies there, um, and then also started to study some of the decomposition processes that were microbially driven. Um, and so more recently using kind of more molecular techniques for finding that there's actually a lot of microbial activity in these deserts. So we sort of got really interested in this and what, what they're doing there and um, how they're surviving. So a little more about, about the Namib, how dry is dry. The mean annual rainfall is 14 millimeters. So if you're not familiar with that kind of metric in Michigan, it's like 1,000 or more. Um, but even in place that's sort of considered dry, like Colorado annual rainfall, it's 300, 350 millimeters. So this is really dry. 
And I'm talking about, in this case, um, just on this western side of the Namib. So the unique thing about the Namib, um, which may, you may have gathered, is that there's this really high input of fog. It's a coastal desert, and that's a lot of deserts that have this cool current. In this case, it's from Antarctica. The Benguela current comes up here. It hits this hot ocean air, um, hot desert air, forms a coastal fog, and so the fog can kind of percolate inland um, and give, in this case, some of the biota a moisture source. But it doesn't, you know, it only can, it can go inland so far. So I really like this picture because the really neat thing about the Namib is it forms this climate gradient across this dune sea. So this picture was actually taken by a, an astronaut on the International Space Station a few years ago on Earth Day. And uh, when someone sent it to me, I was like, oh, that's our gradient because it shows that here's this fog input on the western side. And then on the eastern side, there's very little fog because so fog kind of comes to about here and then it's really not found, uh, doesn't occur anymore. And then here's these rain clouds. So you get rain clouds coming from the east. And so this side is really driven by rainfall input and this side is really driven by fog input. And so he sort of points out these like fog and, and rain clouds on each side. Um, and so we get this nice climate gradient where for pretty much all things else are, are equal. So it's a similar substrate, it's sand, um, it's similar plant species composition across this gradient. Um, and so on the other side, mean annual rainfall is more like 100 millimeters, still really dry. Um, but there's really no fog, and so there's, you know, sort of fewer of these organisms that can make use of the fog. So just to show you some on the ground picture, this is from kind of different sites along across that whole east-west gradient. Um, and so you can see some vegetation, it's pretty spotty, um, but in general, you know, you're dealing with a sand substrate um, across the whole gradient. Okay, so I organized my talk this way that makes me look like some kind of fog biologist or, or fog ecologist or something, which I'm not, but I noticed that the, the data that I'm presenting sort of looks at this ecosystem in, in several, through several lenses. So the first is looking at fog from kind of an ecosystem standpoint where it's just, it's a moisture source to microbes. Um, the second is thinking about fog and other moisture, non-rainfall moisture sources, which I'll explain in a minute, as a selection pressure. So what are these conditions and how do they influence microbial traits? Um, and then finally thinking about more recently, sort of a preliminary data set looking at fog as um, actually a transporter of microbes. So moving from the ocean to the desert. So thinking about that as a community assembly mechanism. Okay, so first I just wanted to jump through um, Decomposition 101. So I mentioned this earlier when talking about arid lands, but starting with carbon dioxide, we have photosynthesis, plants fix carbon dioxide, death occurs, and then decomposition is mainly carried out by microbes. So that's the basic setup that we're sort of studying in this desert. Um, as we study it or as people try to predict it, it becomes a lot more complicated. So this is an example of um, one of the ecosystem models that is like or this is just showing a sub-model predicting decomposition. Um, and so you can see just a lot of parameters go into it. Um, a lot of people when thinking about this and trying to get, get this really accurate because these sorts of things go into kind of predicting a, what the Earth is as a terrestrial carbon source or sink. Um, so in the end, we sort of get this kind of relationship um, where we're looking at on the y-axis proportion of mass loss. So that's like starting with a full plant that's just died and looking at how much mass has, lost, has been lost over time, which is being emitted as CO2. Um, so the main thing I want you to take away from this is just that you know, we're looking at this kind of degrading of, of dead plant material, but the main parameters that are in this model that you don't have to look for are basically litter chemistry, temperature, and rainfall. That's, so that's kind of some known drivers um, of what we know to to across ecosystems kind of influence the rates of decomposition if we wanted to predict what they were in some ecosystem. But in arid lands, um, some of these models don't really match up. So it, it appears to be especially difficult in drier areas to predict how much CO2 is coming out or is, is being performed 
um, in arid land. So it doesn't appear to, to have the same relationship with some of these variables that I mentioned, and it results in underestimation. So it's sort of been a recent effort to figure out what's, what's missing from here. So to illustrate this, this is a recent um, paper that, that looked at just a global data set from litter from a lot of different ecosystems. And here it's not showing mass loss on the y-axis, it's looking at just one of these predictor variables that I mentioned that we know is pretty good at predicting how fast things decompose. So in this case, it's litter chemistry, fraction of initial nitrogen. And so here they just show that, oh, that the big finding was that it's really convergent across ecosystems, that there's this relationship across these really different biomes with this mass remaining. Um, this is just kind of a decomposition rate. But, you know, the, the kind of, it, it feels a little hidden in the paper, but I, I think a really interesting result is like the one thing that really doesn't follow this relationship at all is in arid grassland. So it's not even similar to humid grassland. So it sort of suggests, and there's a lot of other evidence for this that is involved in validating ecosystem models, that something else is going on in dry areas and we don't really get what's happening. So maybe there's certain drivers, but maybe there's other mechanisms. So we've sort of been thinking about this um, in the last few years, and other people, not really the first ones, but in the last decade or so, um, photo degradation has emerged as, as a, a dominant mechanism that maybe we've been missing. So um, that's one thing we're thinking about. This is the direct degradation of litter by UV, and sort of can be mediated through microbes too. The thing that I was gonna talk about today um, is looking at what other moisture sources might be influencing decomposition and asking whether that is sort of a missing link or can account for some of this um, missing or underestimation of decomposition. And I wanted to mention that this is sort of foreshadowing for a little bit later and talking about communities, but all of these mechanisms, even though we're sort of talking about abiotic vari variables, are really acting through microbial function. So. In a way, um, microbial biomass, they're the ones that are kind of doing the work. So biomass or the traits of the microbes, um, their physiology um, constraints are, might kind of modulate these rates. You know. So we kind of started looking when we were working in the, in the NAMIB um, and noticing some of this microbial activity um, under fog and dew that that this has been mentioned in other papers. So for instance, in a desert in Israel, they, they should say that loss in rainless periods accounted for 50% of the annual decomposition. Um, and standing Phragmites in a wet, wetland, they, they say that diel mineralization was observed in rainless periods, presumably because of dew. So it seems like a lot of the examples we found were a lot of people being like, well, we saw mass loss over this time and there wasn't any rain, but you know, we don't really know what it was. It could have also been like, you know, detritivore or something eating it or something. So no one's really gone out and measured this directly. So we kind of wondered, you know, things get really wet under these fog um, events in the NAMIB and in this respiration. So just to show you, and I mean, once I've started thinking about this, you really notice how much water there really is in dew or under dew and um, during a fog. I mean, it's really obvious and going out in the morning when you get soaked just from walking through some grass. Um, and maybe after a it rain, it's, it's equally or, or less wet. So this is actually a picture of my wife and her hair, <laughs> which some of you know. Um, so this I thought was really cool because I was like, wait a second, the fog is like perfectly condensing on your hair. Um, so there's actually, you know, a lot of like dripping water and a lot of water that's accumulating under, um, in fog and dew. So, so we went out basically to measure decomposition and we, we chose this dominant grass, um, a Stipograssus species, basically because it occurs across the whole desert and it makes up a lot of the biomass. So just to, I just wanted to show you some of the kind of growth forms. This is, it grows in these hummock forms. This is a dead plant right here. So you can kind of see the gray is partially bleaching from the sun, partially fungal colonization. Um, but that's kind of a big, dead plant litter, here's some other um, dead plants for your entertainment. So you can just see that it's, it's pretty ubiquitous just across the desert, although not necessarily abundant in kind of a absolute sense. Um, for those that are familiar with measuring decomposition, you know that sort of the standard uh, way to measure it is to put 
this litter in a bag and let it sit and then come back and weigh it or measure the CO2 that comes off of it sometimes. Um, and so we tried to do something different just because we did some preliminary studies to find that basically the bag keeps out the fog and dew. <laughs> so it sort of negates the whole effort. Um, and so my graduate student designed these little racks that they sort of, the little lid pops off and you can put these stems in there individually and then pop it back on. So you can actually take the litter out, weigh it, you know, measure how much CO2, how much it's respiring, um, get how much moisture it's absorbed, and then put it back in for sort of a repeated measurement over time. So he sort of made, we made a ton of these. And, um, and so it's sort of a way to get uh, without, to get a measure of decomposition and respiration without confounding these microclimate variables, which we had no idea were um, really different in the litter bags. So basically we set out to monitor this um, CO2 <coughs> efflux under fog and dew. This is kind of our little mini portable meteorological station. We also had several stations along the way um, or at various sites in the NAMIB. And you can see the rack right there. Here's a few more that we put out over long term to measure a lot mass loss in different sites with different frequencies of fog and dew. Um, so I'll just show you some data. This is just meteorologically the life of a dew. Um, we basically see, as you'd expect, a low temperature. This is showing nighttime. So we see cold during the night, humidity is high. Um, you know, it's a dew point, sort of know what that looks like. The, Useful thing that we had for this project that um, was what's called a leaf wetness sensor, which shows, you know, you can imagine that you might have a light dew or you might have a fog that reduces visibility, but it doesn't really condense on the surface. Well, this little thing just basically measures how much water is condensed right there on the surface. Um, it gives you a percentage. Um, so, so we could actually see, you know, where, is there water biologically available and how much of it? So you can kind of see this little leaf wetness sensor pops up, goes back down, and that's kind of the end of the dew event. So there's not a, like, a lot of times from a meteorological standpoint, they're not necessarily interested in biologically available water. They might be interested in visibility or I don't know what else. There's a lot of people that are meteorologists in this, um, in the area that are studying fog and even dew are a little less so, but they're not really interested in you know, necessarily the biological availability. But the point is we saw gravimetric moisture, so the moisture content of these litter stems go um, shoot up under fog and dew, um, and then CO2 flux kind of spike as well, as you might expect when things get wet and microbes respond to the water. So we also measured it in a few other um, more than this, other other events, but here's another subset. Um, so this was involved a lot of um, early mornings or late nights and, and sort of the wet and cold. But uh, we were able just to get enough of a, a sampling just to show that you know, there was significant CO2 flux under these conditions. So that was kind of the first step. Um, and you know, the next step, the obvious extension is sort of, well, that's great in the NAMI, but is this really a, a big factor in other systems? And, um, kind of thinking about it more globally. So the first thing we noticed just from being out there is that a lot of times the previous focus in decomposition has just kind of all been on rainfall events. So if there's no rain, there's no decomposition, and you know that's the main driver of these rates. Um, but we noticed that when we looked at some of the MET data, um, the duration of these fog events, and this is based on data that's, I forgot the legend, that's, um, how wet that leaf wetness sensor is. So it's basically like how long was water available to microbial communities. Um, and in the pink, yeah, is basically a histogram for the fog events or fog and dew. And then the green or blue is rain. So you can just see that the duration, how long this, is, this period is wet or how long microbes are active is a lot longer um, under these events. So potentially they, they almost have more contribution just based on if you look at how many hours these microbes are active. So that kind of just led us to think, well, it actually could be a big contribution. So we asked, you know, let's scale up first in the NAMIB um, using just our meteorological data. And then also what about for other deserts? So can we develop functions in the NAMIB um, 
that then we can extrapolate to use MET data from other systems and kind of make a more global estimate. So this is an example of that where we looked at, um, sorry you can't see this, but we looked at kind of these different leaf wetness um, categories and then created, this is a frequency distribution, so we kind of looked at how often um, according to relative humidity was the leaf wetness sensor wet versus dry and you know, can we extrapolate that relationship to another ecosystem? These are just different locations. Um, including we also did this in Iowa, which is where my collaborators live, and it was almost just a validation of, okay, does this happen in music grasslands too or wetter places? So we basically found that we were able to kind of estimate the contribution in these different systems. And we're trying to rearrange this graph so it's a little more intuitive, but right now it basically shows carbon loss. So this is often per reported as a percentage, but in this case proportion. So this would be like 0.1 and 1% or 10% um, on a log scale. And then the, the um, plot, the lines are for dotted lines are that's attributed to rain. And then others is either to fog and dew. So, um, so basically we're seeing in, in each system, um, non-rainfall moisture, fog and dew are actually accounting for more of the carbon loss than rain. Um, and that's especially true so in the NAMIB. And in this case, the Gobabeb is actually the western site where I told you it has a lot of fog. So that kind of makes sense that there's a lot of contribution there and not so much from rain. There's not, there's hardly any rain there. Um, so it kind of stacked up and this, um, if you just ignore the rest of the graph and only look at the right side for now, um, that's actually a site in the U.S. in the um, southwest. So Sevilleta um, is a, in the desert southwest, and we used our humidity data from the NAMIB to then try to calculate how much CO2 would be lost from these events in Sevilleta. So this was kind of our attempt to say, you know, is this going to be important in, in ecosystems that aren't famous for their fog input? Um, so we found that it is, and actually when we crunch the numbers on actual empirical data, um, this is just at one site, so our, the, the site where our research station is. Without the non-rainfall moisture we saw, we estimated about 0.06%, this is just from the graph, with non-rainfall moisture about 5.9% loss, and then the actual mass loss from our, um, from our stems and the racks was about 5.2%. This is only for one year of data, um, but at any rate, it makes a strong case for sort of this could be a missing link. And it you know, ended up being more of a, almost a budgeting question where it's like, how much does this account for? But, um, but I think that it, it kind of shows that there is this percentage that could be potentially large in this desert, but also in, in other deserts. So a main finding was this, is that non-rainfall moisture, and that includes dew, so in the past, in the NAMIB anyway, we focused a lot on fog, um, but dew is a lot more ubiquitous on the earth, right? So, so that's gonna be a, a significant driver of decomposition that we're currently missing. So I just wanted to mention the other part of this work um, that's on photodegradation that Robert is doing. Um, so this is my graduate student, and he's doing this um, photodegradation manipulation where he, t he excludes UV from, from um, exposure from litter exposure. So he has some some litter that, that is exposed to UV and some that's not. And one interesting finding um, he's shown, he just started to, so, um, but he's found that these, these stems that are exposed to UV may kind of interact with this non-rainfall moisture absorption. So um, this is just a, a stem that hasn't been exposed to UV that's sort of been shielded and but still exposed to the desert. Oh. Okay, um, is it still going? Wow, still going. So, yeah, so you can see that the, the water droplets just kind of beat up, right? So after, um, presumably, the, the UV is powerful enough to degrade this cuticle waxy layer on the outside, and the water just kind of soaks right in. So he's done these incubations in these, like, little humidity chamber where he's basically showing that if you have UV, it makes dew and fog really 
a lot more effective at sort of stimulating beef composition just because it penetrates the stem. So he's kind of developing this model to think about that. Okay, so I'll move on to kind of more of the biology and, and community ecology now um, with a short discussion of sort of what it, we're thinking about with fog as a selection pressure and then um, thinking about dispersal. So what do we find out? So thinking about this in a biological sense instead of kind of a meteorological and ecosystem, um, we know that non-rainfall moisture, meaning fog dew and also just high humidity um, long duration, is frequent and lasts longer than rain. In drylands, this is when microbes are metabolically active, so we measured that. Um, and then these periods of non-rainfall moisture are characterized by a different set of environmental conditions. And what I mean by that is that they're consistently associated with other meteorological variables. So it forms this different kind of um, climate regime. So this is another histogram showing um, rain conditions and non-rainfall moisture. And as we'd expect, all the things I showed were at nighttime. So um, even high humidity, dew, and fog are really occurring at colder temperatures. So this is um, just sort of suggesting that there's sort of a different climate envelope, I'll call it, um, for microbes that are active under rain versus those that are active under fog and dew. So for example, we can kind of think about the temperature under rain. Rain presumably could occur most any time. It's going to be about the mean temperature. It's going to be the average temperature that occurs. But for fog and dew, it's going to be mostly at night, mostly cold. There's going to be greater evaporation um, under rain, just presumably because it can occur during the day, but evaporation is a lot lower under fog and dew, makes the duration longer. There also might be lower UV because it occurs at night. So um, we were sort of thinking about this in terms of how it shapes the microbial community, and it has bearing on, on the ecosystem function side because the differences in microbes can change these predictive relationships. So the relationships I talked about earlier that are basically used by models well, if there are constraints on the microbial community um, that sort of change this relationship between some pr predictor variable um, and microbial activity, because there's trade-offs or um, different optima or um, different traits, then that's gonna change that relationship. So that's kind of what we looked into. So this is just to reiterate this point that um, a lot of these mechanisms are as I mentioned before, acting through microbial function and sort of modulating it. So here I'm just going to show some quick um, data from isolates that we that we took from the NAMIB across this gradient. So if you remember before, this was sort of can simplistically define this as sort of a fog region on the western side and then a rain region on the eastern side. Um, so you kind of have these different variables that are shaping the microbial communities in these different systems. So here we looked at fungi, and they're just fungal cultures that we um, got from these two different regions. Um, and so we had uh, over 30, now up to like 50 isolates from, from each site, and we really just looked at um, how they grew in different temperature regimes. So we just exposed them to different a range of temperatures and measured growth rate. And so we found that fog, or in the fog region, presumably exposed to more fog, um, had a lower, lower thermal optima um, across the isolates than those in, in the eastern region. And they also produced um, more, or in fog region, they produced less UV resistant pigment. So this is a pigment that fungi produces, you might see a, a darker pigment, um, sort of like a sunscreen that presumably has a cost that um, really only, that really occurred at a greater amount in the rain region. So this suggests that, um, that the things, the selection pressures that are shaping microbes are really shaping them when they're active. So it's not that those microbes in the fog region aren't surviving the other conditions, but in order, the microbes are so good at being dormant that a lot of these microbes probably have very slow growth rates, low turnover times at these, in this desert especially. Um, but in order to actually you know, mineralize and um, build the biomass, they're gonna have to create you know, adaptations that for surviving under 
conditions when moisture is available. So with that motivation, we're currently testing this in a, a larger scale where we've taken litter from both sides of the gradient and just switched them. So um, we have stems that are from the western side that are placed at the western side and then sort of transplanted them reciprocally. Um, we also have done, had some stems that we've sterilized and transplanted them and that kind of um, will inform a little bit about what's colonizing those stems and what's then exposed. So we're kind of trying to separate this influence of um, local adaptation of these microbes and how they might influence function. So here's the kind of, we're doing this with the racks again. Okay, so that was just a brief um, few data and kind of where we're going with that. Um, so the last thing is some new data that um, looks at fog, the biology of fog. So fog is a dispersal vector. So just a little background that I've been catching up on too into aerobiology. There's been a lot of work recently about microbes that are present in air. They're really ubiquitous even in really high you know, upper troposphere in air. Um, and I, microbes as cloud nucleators. So they're not really, they're not just in clouds, but they kind of can help form clouds just like aerosol particles can act as nucleators. Um, microbes can also act as nucleators. Um, but there's been less work on the kind of low clouds or, or fog and microbes in fog and what the ecological role of this is. I will say generally there's been a, not that much work thinking about the ecological role of these sort of microbes in, in air pools or air um, compartments. But so the neat thing about the knob, as I mentioned, is that there's not just fog, but the fog comes from the ocean. It's formed most of it. Um, there's also locally formed fog, um, but it's formed from this cold current hitting the desert, um, and it kind of has a, a movement inland. So we basically wondered um, if there's microbes in this fog. So what are the implications of uh, these ocean microbes um, that could be picked up, picking up other debris, and sort of deposited in this totally alien desert ecosystem that's hyper-arid, um, and whether they survive, um, what the diversity is like in these systems, um, and what the ecology is like. So a second, just to s spend on the theoretical framework of this, this is actually, and usually I spend more time on this because I have other projects that manipulate dispersal and think about this. Um, but in microbial ecology, uh, dispersal is gaining recognition as, a, as an important assembly mechanism, kind of like people have thought about it in plants. But this role is uncertain. But this is kind of coming with some baggage because previous to the last five years or so, it was sort of considered neg neg negligible. Um, so the quote, everything is everywhere and the environment selects has sort of been pervasive in our field, just thinking basically meaning that Dispersal is never limiting in microbes. And um, this is mainly because microbes are easily transported in wind and air. Um, they grow fast. They're potentially functionally very redundant. They have high dormancy. So it's, it's not too far of a stretch to think that whenever a function is needed or whenever the environmental conditions are well suited for that function, that the right microbe would be around to make it happen. Um, so this is sort of a larger scale question um, that we're now finding that there is a lot of dispersal limitation that um, when we have different dispersal rates into different ecosystems or um, different areas that it does shape sort of local community diversity. But it, it's sort of up in the air as to actually how that fits in. So we're doing some other work on this in my, in my lab with fungal dispersal and, and some um, plant-associated microbial dispersal in agroecosystems and thinking about it in a much more specific and mechanistic sense. So what limits these, um, what's the ecological um, implications for their symbiont of them sort of not arriving or arriving. So back to this sort of straightforward question of first asking, are there microbes in, in NAMIB fog? 
So we went out and, and, and simply used what I later found were completely acceptable methods in the aerobiology field um, and tried to collect these fog and rain and, and air microbes in a sterile way. So this was actually really challenging just because most of the time a lot of, if, if you're trying to collect something, it's inherently contaminated by either your instrument or your hands or your any collection device. Um, so we actually let, we use this sterile mylar sheet on this um, kind of one by one meter, this platform, sterilized it, took a blank, um, sterilized it again, um, and we just let the fog water condense on it, run down into this trough. This is actually during the rain, but, um, and then sampled it, pulled it out, filtered it through um, a syringe filter, and that's sort of the community we got for sequencing. We also, each in each of these events, would put out plates to let the fog just condense on the plate itself. So we're looking at what's depositing, um, and we can kind of get a sense for what's viable in, in the fog, not just kind of what DNA is there. We also kind of had to make use of um, the opportunistic. We were on the road a lot in this trip, and this is a, a picture of when we just stuck the mylar sheet on this car windshield, because <laughs> the fog is sort of condensing up here, and it was just running down, and we were like, let's just stick it on there and you know, sterilize the heck out of it. And so, so we actually get, got pretty good data like on the road with that too. So, but you can see I was sort of skeptical. <laughs> like, I don't know about that. Okay, so then here's just we, um, what in the aerobiology field is called settle plates. We simply just let the, the dust and microbial cells settle on these plates that we kind of put in all different directions um, at different sites and, and then wash them and filter them. We also had a rain, which was totally unexpected. Um, so we collect that, collected that in the same way, this um, kind of one by one meter sheet. Um, and so we did this culturing and filtering all in the field. Um, if it, anyone is familiar with the NAMIB, there's some Wellwitchia in the background <laughs> there. Um, so, so we kind of just let them grow up and cultured them and isolated them um, directly right there. So we didn't really want to preserve the samples, except for the DNA samples, for later just to get, we wanted to see if there's anything viable in, in these samples. Okay, so I'm gonna go through these and, um, so we have both culture and isolate data, but we also have sequencing data. So I'm kinda gonna go through each result as sort of a cultures, showing some pictures, and then some sequencing. Because if you don't know, um, we can culture about 1% of the soil microbial community or capture that much diversity that's in um, most microbial communities. So culturing, while it's nice to look at and it's really great to measure phenotypes, um, doesn't always get the whole picture. In this case, it was pretty consistent. Um, so I'm just gonna point out three things that we've learned so far. Um, one, there's different microbes in rain, wind, and fog. So. Um, we sort of did morphological analysis on these and we've, we've isolated and cultured these um, different fungi. And so once we look at the sequencing data, um, so this is whole sequencing of the either 16S for bacteria, um, conserved gene region, or ITS for fungi, um, and just place them on an ordination that look at community similarity. So how similar are the total number of OTUs or species um, in each of these communities. So we, while we found that you know, for a single event, they were all different, we don't necessarily find support that maybe all fog microbes or all fog microbial communities seem to look alike. You know, the one, the fog that occurred two months ago doesn't really look that much more similar than the fog that occurred today than maybe two air samples did. Um, but I will say, I'll mention this later, that we also don't see that the fog looks exactly like the air that you know was an hour ago, right before the fog. So something is happening under fog, but um, we didn't really find that you know all all of these types would converge, except for maybe in the ocean. So these are ocean samples um, over here. So not surprising, they're really different from um, a lot of the others. I'll revisit that in a minute. So the second thing is that we. 
it's looking like microbes are sort of deposited under fog events. So you may have heard about this with, um, I know there's been some aerosol research looking at rain and how rain kind of cleans the air of aerosols. So it, this suggests that that happens with fog as well. So this is just two plates that were set out and exposed to the air um, for six hours before a fog. And then once in just the three hours of the fog, um, we see just a lot more growth and a lot more diversity. Um, and so just kind of greater deposition. And this stacks up with some of the sequencing data, at least for diversity, we kind of see in both fungal and bacterial communities that there's this baseline diversity that may be de deposition under air. Fog is a little bit higher in both cases. So we see a greater diversity. And then it kind of goes back to, to lower after the fog. And so in addition to kind of thinking about maybe fog deposits these microbes into the ecosystem, um, it also <laughs> alters the aerosol community. So like I mentioned before, that kind of a null hypothesis might be that whatever is in the air right now, if a fog comes along, it's gonna deposit it and then, um, then, then that's kind of the similarity or that's it. But we actually find that, you know, right before a fog, this is just showing arrows of like the same time event or kind of a time series. So this is pre-south fog and this is post-south fog. This is the south site fog. So we kind of see this big jump over here. These are two replicates within the same fog. And then this jump over here. So we kind of see the same thing in the fungi where we kind of jump over here. And the post isn't quite as different as um, the pre from the fog. Um, but we do see it's almost the same amount of variation as kind of the daily variation that we saw over time. Okay, the last thing is, is getting back to this idea that these were actually originated in the ocean. And I mentioned kind of casually earlier that it's not surprising that they're not, they don't look exactly like ocean microbes. Well, it's, it's a little surprising, I guess, because they, this is ocean water, it came from the ocean. So it could have looked really similar. We did find a lot of these ocean microbes um, that were indicator species in the ocean that were also in these fog samples. So 77% of the OTUs um, were, fog, were ocean sample or ocean OTUs. Um, and that was a higher percentage than fog that we measured that was kind of locally formed. So you do kind of see the signature of ocean um, in these coastal fogs that have originated from the ocean, but not maybe that high of a mound. But this site is also 40 kilometers from the ocean. So it's pretty far inland and there's a lot of opportunities to pick up dust and other aerosol and debris. Um, so this has kind of been the advantage of working with this other group that's been doing similar work in Maine um, because they also have samples that are really close to the ocean, so much closer to the coast. Um, and in their samples, some of the ones close to the coast are up to 75% of the reeds or sort of the abundance of the species are ocean taxa that are kind of being deposited in these terrestrial systems. So it may sort of suggest that we have some more um, samples to analyze that are closer to the ocean and in the NAMA, but um, suggests that maybe that, that this intuitive hypothesis that it depends on ocean proximity is correct. But some of the people that we work with that are meteorologists meteorologists just really think this is totally oversimplified and the fog never goes directly from the ocean to the desert and you know so there's a lot of nuance there um, but it's been an interesting you know kind of preliminary data set so the next the next steps that we're working on now is trying to synthesize some of this and think about these together um, so so the first step that that this is a recent analysis that we wanted to check and see is, okay, great, there's microbes in fog, but you know, I'm a terrestrial ecologist. Um, I really wanna know what, if it has any bearing or any implications for the community diversity or for the function in the, that terrestrial environment. So I saw the first step in kind of linking some of these is just seeing if any of these microbes that are dispersing, that are kind of immigrants or um, from outside system are even surviving or actively contributing to, to ecosystem function. So we kind of just took some of our existing data sets. We've done a lot of Amplicon 
interesting S and H or ITS sequencing in this desert and some from collaborators and just kind of did uh, um, overlap analysis where we just said how many are present in each um, sort of compartment. So in this case, this is showing on the x-axis um, the proportion of, in this case, fungi, um, OTUs from fog. So this is just taking all the fungal OTUs that we found in fog and expressing it as a proportion. Um, and so you can see that maybe we're seeing a lower percentage of these fog microbes that are present and abundant in soil, um, maybe a little higher. And the difference in live plants and dead plants is live plants is the fungi are endophytes, they're contributing to the organism, and um, in dead plants, they're generally saprophytes or decomposers. So, so you kind of see, you know, maybe there's a lower proportion in soil, maybe that's because they're not, they're, um, they're colonizing less, but maybe it's also because there's a ton of dormant organisms that are just sitting there in soil. The other caveat of this work that I'm still trying to figure out how to deal with is that these aren't, although a lot of the, you know, ocean microbes are maybe clearly not big players in, in the desert, but a lot of the fog is picked up from the dust, you know, as it moves inland. So thinking about these as kind of an external, you know, immigrant may not be the right kind of way to think about it. Maybe that the types of plants that are there is actually influencing what's in the fog. So, so I'm trying to kind of adjust so that it's not like these are external players coming in. But anyway, the other thing that we found is that, that I was really interested in testing. We also have data that's looking at um, BRDU, which is a way of assessing activity of microbes, or just the active portion of the microbial community. And so it wasn't just that these microbes are kind of landing and dying and their DNA is still there, and so they're sequencing it. So these were actually, these fog microbes, 10 or 15%, were actually active and contributing to the ecosystem. Okay, so the last thing that maybe would provide a little evidence of these contributing to function is going back to this gradient. And you might hypothesize that if we have all these fog microbes coming into the desert, maybe we're gonna see a lot more in the western side than the eastern side, which gets no fog input. And so far, we don't really see that. And um, we're working on kind of doing this in a better way. But maybe in endophytes we see this, but this is basically um, you know, taking these compartments and saying, okay, this is the average, or this is actually only the western site, or maybe the average between the sites, but just branching them out and saying, okay, let's look at the, the difference in the two sites. Um, in living plants, there's maybe a higher proportion in the west, but I'm not really sure I'm convinced that that's you know, necessarily because of the dispersal. So, more to be done on that, but that's kind of the direction we're going and sort of thinking about whether there's a link between these and um, you know, whether we can think about this as an assembly process or if it's kind of indeed negligible. So um, I hope I've just managed to kind of engage your curiosity in the Namib Desert and also just you know, learn a little about the, the major issues that we're grappling with in microbial ecology. Um, it's a fun system to work in. so. Basically, the take home so far from this work, and you know, we're hoping to kind of create a framework that can, in the next steps, do something bigger. But, um, but we did find that there's a really big need to account for non-rainfall moisture and dryland decomposition. So my collaborator, Kathy Todd Brown, has really taken this and running with it in the modeling side, and you know, trying to collect a lot more data for validation um, from desert ecosystems. Um, we also found that there, there kind of are fog basking microbes, so microbes do adapt to frequent fog and dew. They're, they seem to form different um, traits in that area, but we're looking at the whole community level now. And then fog transports and deposits microbes into terrestrial systems, so um, that's a new finding that hasn't been shown before. So next steps, like I mentioned, we're doing a more sophisticated source sink analysis with this fog and terrestrial compartments um, with maybe a little bit more theoretical rigor behind it. Um, we're looking at these reciprocal transplants to try to connect these traits to function, and we're also doing some more isolate work related to that decomposition assays in the lab. And then we're also starting to look at the traits um, 
an undergrad this summer actually took all the isolates that we got from the fog and air um, sampling and is sort of looking is there something about these microbes that make them suitable for dispersal through fog or deposition through fog. Um, and so that should be kind of interesting work. So thanks so much for listening um, to some of those new data sets. I just want to acknowledge my funding sources and again, collaborators um, and the staff at So I'll take questions. Thanks. Yeah, they are different. So that's why we thought that, yeah, they're overall, um, they have different total communities and active communities. So I think there's some potential there to look at like what's driving that or what, what are the differences. I mean, let's, yeah, that's true. We, we do have some isolates that are, you know, at least genetically classified as the same that it would be interesting to look into that were isolated from both sites. Um, but yeah, I think that will be interesting just because we do know that it's different, but we don't really know if it's from climate or something else. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, we don't have very good sampling of, I think the best would be somehow sample like the ocean spray or something, but I think there's kind of two questions there. Is one is if the ocean community is, or surface community is changing, but then also the you know wind or air current conditions that might dictate kind of the fog conditions. And definitely wind speed and direction, at least in our clear air samples, were like the biggest predictor of microbial community composition. So it sort of suggests that like whatever it's blowing up or, you know, the direction of where it's coming from is sort of determining that. But that's a good question. I don't know that. Does it have convection? Is that what you asked? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, we've been talking to the um, Roland Volt, the meteorologist there, um, about the different classifications of the fog system. So yeah, there is, um, but we've kind of been figuring out how to infer those things from the MET data that we have, which we have a lot, which is good, but it's just not my area of expertise. So <laughs> I'm happy for him to think about that and then me to be like, oh, what does that mean for the biology? <laughs> but that's an interesting point. Yeah, the termites. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, well, we do. We have had one observation that they're um, they're grazing preferentially on fungal fungally colonized litter. We haven't done a study to look at whether that's because of something with the fungi or it's just a kind of lower C to N, like better nutrient foraging. Um, but yeah, I think in the past. So we should kind of crunch those numbers because in the past, they sort of attributed all decomposition to mites and termites. And so now we know that a large proportion is also microbial, but um, it would be good to have that proportion because I think there's still a lot of eating of this litter that makes it go away. But yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, so I've been trying to get a measure of primary productivity, mostly to drive this model. Um, 
And there's some, it's hard because it's so patchy to estimate, and I'm trying to get someone to estimate it with like aerial photography. Um, it varies a lot year to year. I don't know, we know that, but we have we do have some numbers of it. Um, there's not a lot of cyanobacteria in the dunes portion, but there is in the part that I showed you this more gravel. So there's these little micro ecosystems under quartz rocks that the rock sort of gathers water and the light can shine through the quartz and it supports these cyanobacteria which then support like a whole little ecosystem. I don't, I think someone has estimated the contribution of that to primary production. Heather Troop is working on that. I know she's measuring respiration of those, but I don't know what that is. I think you'd probably have to look at dew just because it's so much more ubiquitous. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think also the interesting thing about that is maybe fog and dew stimulate above ground microbes, but, and they, there are plants in the Namib that have adapted to make use of that as a water source, but rain is so much more important for net primary production. So you kind of have to think that relates to your question where it's like carbon balance is going to deter be determined by the net of those. So maybe fog and dew would really drive the microbial activity in that frequency interannually, but rain is really going to drive how much uptake of carbon. So I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, we haven't looked at that. And I think it, it's good to, there are people working on kind of forecasting changes in fog and dew and clouds. 